A number of Concord Farragut residents took jobs in the Oak Ridge plants. And the, when the government lifted the restrictions uh, of people working in Oak Ridge, the, many of them began moving uh, to West Knox County. This, of course, hastened the development of subdivisions in, in the Farragut community. The improvements brought about the Concord Telephone Exchange in the First Utility District made this a very attractive place to live. However, however not all the long-time residents were sure how good it was going to be to have all these foreigners coming into the, our community. <laughs> I, for one, believe time has proven that it was a good mix. Although this is no longer a community where everyone knows everyone else, it is a wonderful place to live. Along with all the people moving in there, of course, you had the children. You're going to have a lot more students. And so by the 1950s, it was obvious that something was going to have to be done. The buildings you see there, there were at this time, by 19, uh, mid 50s, there were other structures, uh, classrooms in different places, and portables and things like that. So they decided, now since the one on your left, the elementary building was gone, there was another elementary building over there, they're going to have to tear down the big old 1906 building and construct a new high school facility. So the class of 1957-58 was the last graduating class that had this one, uh, that old, the old building there. And in the summer of 1958, they began to tear it down. They started this new, very modern looking building, and this was going to be completed, as we were discussing earlier. It seems that the completion didn't really take place until January of 59. Now, the first graduated class is 1958-59 for this year. And so they, they constructed this building. Now the gym was going to still be there, and the auditorium. And they, they tore down not only the old building, they tore down the principal's house. And there was like a little garden between there with some rocks and some flowers and things out there between the principal's house and the old building itself. All that was taken away. This building was placed in there. And then they, we still had some altered classrooms. We had to go into other places until everything was completed. Okay. So here's a picture from down near the road uh, going up there, part of the building you can see there. Now, of course, this is taken when there's no leaves around, but the building was a little better looking than this. It says 1960. Uh, for example, in 1959 class, there were 54 seniors. That's it, 54 for the whole senior class. And when you get to, by a decade later, you're going to have many, many, many students. Uh, Farragut High School later on is going to end up as the largest high school in the state. And one of those years, when I was asking it was the largest high school, we also had said the largest middle school at that time was Farragut Middle School. Farragut schools have evolved into four uh, buildings, four schools. The primary school is now on Campbell Station Road, as you probably know. Lots of students over there. Then the intermediate school is over on the campus. Now, the one you're looking at here right there, this is the high school. And if you pan, you go over to the east and so the north. You'll swing around. You'll get to the Farragut Middle School and then to the Farragut Intermediate School. So Farragut has become a great system with four schools, thousands of students, a wonderful reputation, and it began with great promise, and it has fulfilled those promises. Now I'm going to bring you up to more recent times, um, and I want to set the scene for what this place looked like in about the mid-70s to the late 70s. Um, Frank has already mentioned that there were a number of people starting to move to this area back in the 60s, I guess, um, particularly driven by the, um, the growth of uh, jobs at Oak Ridge. Uh, I myself was one of those who came from, we're originally from North Carolina, but we had to do a stint in Detroit for nine years. Couldn't wait to get out of there, but uh, got a job at Oak Ridge, and here we are ever since. Um, but um, if you recall, um, at that time, Walker Springs was about the end of development uh, going west. Uh, I-40 was there, and as you drove past Walker Springs, what you started to see was cows grazing, uh, a dairy farm, um, and a lot of vacant land. Until you get to Campbell Station, 
and you get off Camel Station at that time, and there's a Stuckey's uh, on the corner. That's what you used to see out in the country, right? Uh, on on highways, but taking trips. And um, there was actually a settlement uh, down the road, uh, pretty sizable, and we had. Um, uh, a number of um, subdivisions already. We moved into Village Green, but there were others. Fox Den had started, uh, Stonecrest, and Thornton Heights, and Kingsgate. And they were all there, but we, we totaled probably then about uh, 5,000 people or so. I'm trying to read my slides up there, and I can't see them very well. So, <laughs> how about nodding if I miss something? Obviously, it was very clear this was going to be the growth area for Knox County for the next 20 years or so. And uh, one of those reasons is because we had more flat land than, than a, lot of, a lot of areas of the county has. And that uh, is more conducive to uh, cheaper housing. Uh, but what we saw uh, was people building houses without permits. There was no enforcement. I don't, I don't really know if they, they were very diligent about codes enforcements. Um, now they would deny all this, but the fact is that yes, people were building houses without permits. Uh, commercial uh, that existed then was uh, not a lot, but those new uh, commercial facilities that were com coming in online were seemed to be there seemed to be no plan. Uh, they were basically approved whatever. And in fact, um, at one point, uh, Knox County Commission actually considered uh, zoning all of Kingston Pike from city li Knoxville city limits to the Loudoun County line as commercial, with no plan whatsoever. <coughs> but they didn't pass it. But that, thank goodness. But it, it, you can be. It's kind of scary when, when they're talking about that much land uh, and that much commercial, and you feel like saying, "Can you say Clinton Highway?" Because that's what was happening then when we were concerned about what was happening out here. And the problem for us, who, who, who had issues with the county and who wanted to pursue uh, solutions that were better than what we were seeing was to go to county commission meetings and protest or make a case for doing something different. To do that, you had to drive downtown, find a place to park, meetings were in the afternoons, not night, and you had to take off work. And typically what they did was, uh, you know, we have in our Board of Mayor and Alderman meetings, we have the first item on the agenda is a citizen's forum for anybody to come in and say whatever they want. Um, we don't get that many takers, but uh, uh, they didn't have such a thing. And in fact, if you wanted to speak on an issue, you had to just kind of butt in on, on that particular discussion. Or if you just wanted to say something in general, you had to wait to the end of the meeting. And um, typically, when they got to that point, they they would delay or postpone the issue that you wanted to talk about if they saw that they're. I, I'm not putting. I'm not going to attach motive to this, but uh, it, what happened was that typically. Uh, Issues we were worried about, they would postpone. Uh, so and so's not here. We can't do it. Um, and they wear you down. And um, a, a lot of us didn't know others. Others of us were having the same issues, and so there was 
there was a pocket of people over here who are boiling about an issue. There's another pocket over here somewhere else. Uh, my issue was drainage in, in Village Green. As you know today, we still deal, deal with the legacy of poor planning in that subdivision. And there's little we can do to correct it at this point. That would have to be a massive correction. Um, so my issue was drainage control and uh, enforcement and other people's issues were zonings or uh, what they were proposing to place in, in a particular commercial site. And um, we came together somehow and uh, decided that the only way we get out of this is to become our own government, self-determination. And <clears throat> to do that would mean that we had to incorporate, which basically you can, can, you can think of it as seceding from Knox County. Although, you know, we're still Knox County citizens, still pay tax to them. But the, the proposition of starting a new town from scratch with a bunch of local yokels uh, was pretty daunting. We had, to, we had to define boundaries in legal terms. We had to, had a, they had an antique law about incorporating, which said that if you are proposing to incorporate a city that is within another, within five miles of another city, then you can't do it unless the other, the other city of 100,000 people or more. You can't do it unless that other city lets you do it. So we had to stay outside of five miles from, from uh, Knox, the, the closest Knoxville city limits. It also said that if you uh, are within two miles of any city of under 100,000, they could stop you. I'll come back to that. Um, the other antique part of this um, statute was that we had to make a list of voters in Ferry. And in the, in the domain that we were proposing to incorporate, well, we have an election commission for that. Um, and it was pretty modern at that time. They didn't have books, they had computer thing, thingies that they, they used for voter registrations. But we still had to have this book. And so and when we had a referendum, you had to be both a Knox County registered voter, and you had to prove that. And you had to prove that your name was in the book. Some people got left out, uh, unfortunately. But uh, we did the best we could. And the way we did it was to send people down to the election commission to copy their records into a book. And, and basically, they copied it down on paper and brought it back to the Village Green Clubhouse and transcribed it to, into the book. Um, they didn't make it very easy to incorporate, <laughs> let's put it that way. And we had to pay for the referendum, which we estimated was going to be several thousand dollars, so we had to collect money. And, uh, and we had to prepare all the legal documents to do it. And all of it had to be secret because we knew as soon as some people knew that what we were doing, they were going to come after us. And uh, amazingly, we managed to keep it secret. Um, I think I said those things on that. <laughs> Let's move on to another slide. So the way this happened was in September of 1979, um, some people organized a group of people to come and talk about this process, this possibility, and the process of incorporating. It was uh, mid-September that year. They asked me to come since I had had such issues with drainage. And, um, and we, we agreed at that, at that meeting we were going to go forward with it. 